time-sharing computing world was expanding rapidly by the end of the 1960s, as a plethora of computer companies jumped in on the concept which Dartmouth had popularized. Companies like DEC, IBM, and HP all made computer models marketed for their time-sharing capabilities. But General Electric, who had supplied the computers to Dartmouth, took an early lead in providing these mainframes for education. Their computers would power a New York statewide initiative called the Huntington Project, which sought to both connect institutions and provide educational simulation, which provided many students' first real access to interactive computer experiences. For those who wanted to go even further, there was also plenty of opportunity to program and make something of their own. At Syosset High School in Syosset, New York, one student took a much more creative route than the common step of recreating card games to learn programming. Christopher Galo would birth the game High Noon, a turn-based Wild West shooter tactics game with combat reminiscent of tabletop war games. Gala was connected to a time-sharing service as part of the Huntington Project through a company called Call a Computer, with their local processing centered at Melville, New York, eight miles away, a clear indication of how access was becoming widespread beyond even the physical confines of a computer space. The typical access to such tech would have been through a teletype, with restricted use on how much one could save or access from the central server. That didn't stop Galo from writing his program, though, beginning in late 1969 and creating a finalized version that was printed on September 12th of 1970. The setup is simple. In High Noon, the player faces outlaw Black Bart in a classic Western standoff, 100 paces from each other with four shots each. One gets gunned down, the other gets to walk away proud. The combat begs comparison to much later strategy and tactics games that operated on such an intimate level, rather than the operations of armies as most such games did. Advancing forward allows the player better accuracy for shooting at their target, but Black Bart also gets better shot, should he choose to shoot. One can hide behind a water trough to completely negate a bullet, but only twice. The player also has the option to surrender or run, should they desire life over glory. The storytelling element here is very important to recognize. Games in the past had never really been seen as a platform for telling stories, unless it was in the esoteric sense of a chess as war metaphor. This captivating quality is a large part of what makes High Noon unique, even if it's not fully developed. There's not really any context to Black Bart's actions, meaning the strategy is pure math, and not particularly compelling. However, it attracted interest despite this. Galo freely distributed the game after being contacted by an employee of the Call of Computer Network, preserving a unique piece of historical documentation that explains how these terminal games spread. It was a game where the setting was the real focus. Many other game authors at the same time were liberally cribbing from pop culture settings to adapt mechanics around them. Such is the case with an incredibly influential game released the following year, which took its subject matter quite seriously in order to develop something unrivaled in complexity. At least for computer games of the time. The original Star Trek series ended in 1969 but had a massive influence throughout the 1970s after it hit syndication. Programmers especially took to it, becoming a cultural force which would inspire generations of eager coders. Several early programmers were inspired by Star Trek to create their own games, but the program which would have the most important impact would be created by Mike Mayfield. Mayfield was a high school student in Via Park, California, who was first introduced to computers during a trip to the University of California in Irvine as he neared his senior year. 
Fascinated by the potential and having no mainframe access at his own school, he managed to gain computer access by swiping information from a computer class registry and signing in as students who hadn't had a password assigned to them at the time. In the UC Irvine Computer Lab, there were two computers, a PDP-10 and a scientific data system Sigma-7, a far less popular but still substantial mainframe. In a separate room from the main lab, there was a vector monitor display hooked into the PDP-10, and in that environment, students would play Space War. Mayfield was immediately intrigued. Even so long after its inception, this game was still a marvel to behold, and he wanted to make something like that. However, his computer access was limited to the Sigma-7, which only had teletype terminals for input and output. Well, he only knew BASIC anyways, so that's what he would use. It would be during the summer of 1971, before he actually went to UC Irvine for college, that Mayfield came to the conclusion of using the Star Trek setting for a game. Driving from the beach to the computer lab, Mayfield would code the program onto a single spool of paper tape using ideas that he and his friends brainstormed. Naturally, this game would be about spaceship exploration and combat. While he couldn't be very sophisticated with his portrayals of these things, he still wanted to have position-based combat rather than an obscure text realm. This style was based off of the ASCII computer text standard, and would be the first time someone applied this style to a game to create scenes which were spatial and crudely visual as well. This was all in service to a turn-based tactics game, in which the player is tasked with eliminating all the Klingon threats within a time limit of 30 days. While obviously running a bit counter to the show's peaceful message, the game captured the thrill of the infrequent space combat and the sense of a wider galaxy as well. This game was an adventure. At the helm of the Starship Enterprise, the player has the choice of which quadrant to visit as they scan for the Klingon threat. They are at the mercy not only of the time limit, but also of running out of energy and shields as well, which they recharge at a star base. Once they enter combat with a Klingon vessel, they contend with the tactical combat system. Both combatants choose where they will fire and where they will move at the same time, and a player can set their trajectory without actually confirming a specific spot to move to, allowing the computer to guide them along slightly diagonal lines. Players could encounter any number of Klingons within a sector, and each photon torpedo they took would add days to the repair time. The overall strategy element to the game was slight, but it did showcase the same sort of skill as Space War. In truth, there was nothing on this scale that had ever been written entirely for a computer. From the multi-tiered sections of the universe to the extended bouts of partially graphical combat, a good many trees died to give us this game. Mayfield didn't initially intend to leave the program to be discovered by others, keeping what he thought was the only copy to himself. But in October of 1972, he ported Star Trek over to an HP 2000C computer with some cleanups to the code, and from there, it would become a staple in the mainframe basic scene for years to come. Star Trek was the first computer game with overarching objectives and a grand plan that players could master. One could say that it was the first true computer game, one which took quite a time to play and understand while continuing to have replayability beyond the simple novelty of it being a game run through a computer. Bergeson's baseball program, however in-depth, had been hands-off and didn't really allow for a freedom of player expression as well as Star Trek did. While scanning for Klingons could get tedious, this new experiential frontier was far from its final outing. Let us recall what had sparked Mayfield's interest in creating the game, though. Space War. 
not on a PDP-1 either. The spread of the program had been rampant and continued to impress even nine years after its creation. There had simply been no widespread video games which came close to its level of excitement and polish. From coast to coast, select university students discovered space war on the computers it began to migrate to through communities and unique ports to new platforms. Particularly at Stanford, where Steve Russell had wound up after moving west, the popularity of the game was explosive. It had not grown outdated, and the market for real-time video games was still wide open. Hmm, a market. Do you smell coins? We've been speaking mostly to the computer industry here, but the coin-operated entertainment business is a beast of its own. The overall background is long and complicated, but the broad strokes of technological innovation were setting the stage for something big. The early 20th century had brought on penny arcades, amusement parlors whose name shows exactly how far inflation has taken us. Following that trend, gambling became the major force in coin-op entertainment, lending the industry as a whole a seedy reputation for years to come. Pinball would become the primary attraction in the 1930s, and from then on, the coin-op industry became a technology-driven market. Japan was particularly advanced in this field, starting in the late 1950s, with electromechanical games which pushed the limits of design and creativity before the digital age. These physical contraptions utilized visual trickery to create fantastic scenes that players could control, and these machines would help distance coin-operated amusements from gambling devices. It was from these roots that video games would first become commercial, rather than simply being distributed freely across computers. How, though? There was a reason for the lack of distribution, seeing that computers were still top-scale items of the day. Ralph Baer had begun to develop electronic games completely divorced from a stored program, but something like Space War is what the people really wanted to see, and what the underground programmers really wanted to show. And so it was from Stanford's roots that we get our tree. Space War had migrated there in 1962, and the concentration of technically-minded students meant that at least one or two people hit upon the idea of spreading it. Bill Pitts was one of them, an adventurous statistics student at the university who had a habit of breaking into buildings on campus as a bit of a self-imposed challenge. And one day, he found himself inside the main center for computer research at Stanford, the Stanford AI Lab, SAIL. Within its walls was a computer of legend, a PDP-6 which epitomized the Stanford computer legacy. Now, Pitts had already taken some computer courses before, but what struck him about the sale machine was its time-sharing capabilities, as he had never seen a computer which could be operated by several people at once. That potential got him truly invested in computers, and he became part of the AI lab spending nights over there to be at one with the machine, or something. Pitts had already been playing Space War on a campus PDP-1 by that time, but the AI lab was fanatical about the game. Space War had been part of sales since the beginning, with the likes of Steve Russell and others making sure that the game continued to be a lab mainstay even in the wake of difficulties with the administrators. It was the absolute hub for Space War Fever, and it wasn't just Pitts who discovered the game there, either. He introduced the game to high school friend Hugh Tuck, who conjured up a pie-in-the-sky idea about making the game into a coin-op device, with a single computer running multiple instances of Space War in order to help recoup costs faster. 
Stanford students had developed a time-sharing system specifically for allocation of resources while playing Space War, so it wasn't an entirely new concept. However, the several tens of thousands of dollars in cost was an issue. Even DEC's cheapest hardware of the time was simply incapable of running games like that. They'd have insurmountable trouble getting a return on investment. That was until DEC brought out the PDP-11 computer in 1970. Its startling affordable cost was 11,000 US dollars. More importantly though, the power had increased substantially from DEC's other lower end models and thus was capable of filling the needs of Pitts and Tuck. Pitts, having graduated by that time, decided that he wanted to go full in on the Enterprise, so he and Tuck formed a partnership named Mini Computer Applications in May of 1971, getting to work on their coin-operated Space War clone in July. Pitts was on programming, Tuck on construction. It had all the main features, the accurate star map, the center star, as well as options for gravity and speed via a menu it was not a total clone. For instance, the hyperspace functioned differently by rendering a player invisible and invulnerable while it was held down, which consumed a bar of fuel. If that fuel dropped to zero, the whole ship cracked to pieces. They also included a novel option for single player, a practice mode with a pacifistic spaceship which avoided the now lethal sun. The two of them remotely hooked the computer to a vector monitor display held inside a walnut cabinet, which had a seat built in for the long play sessions, as well as requisitioned joysticks from B-52 fighter jets for controls. Quite a step up from the handmade boxes and switches that other people were using to play Space War. The duo, along with Tuck's family, provided the sum 200,000 US dollars of overall investment to make the machine a reality which would take some time to recoup at a dime to play, or a quarter for three plays. By the time of the game's completion, the two weren't expecting to make money to start. Their initial plan was to recreate a mostly faithful version of Space War, then go back to see how they could reduce the overall cost. Their plan was to, instead of installing the machine in traditional coin-op venues, to create a sensation at university campuses by giving the machine to a location and splitting the take with student unions. There was somebody, though, that was going the more traditional route, and he contacted Pitts and Tuck after hearing about their work on the machine. The man at the other end of the phone invited them up to arcade game manufacturer Nutting Associates plant in Mountain View, California, to see what they could learn from each other. That man was Nolan K. Bushnell, who had come into contact with Space War at Stanford as well. He had previously been employed at Lagoon Amusement Park in Framingham, Utah, which had an arcade that he eventually became co-manager of. A tinkerer from an early age, Bushnell studied as an electrical engineer at the University of Utah, and what he really wanted was to create rides for Walt Disney. He was a bit too young to have been hired, though, so instead, he followed a good opportunity at a technology company called Ampex Corporation in Sunnyvale, California. Primarily known for its magnetic tape equipment, it had branched out into computerized systems, including a remote file storage system called VideoFile. The combination of computer and video technology employed by VideoFile would be important for both his own experience and the connections he established there. In 1970, he invited his friend and fellow Ampex co-worker Samuel Frederick Ted Dabney Jr. down to the Stanford AI lab to view Space War, and caught his interest. Bushnell was a born businessman, so it came to mind that selling Space War to the public would be a new evolution in coin-op entertainment. He had to go through the same throttles as Pitts and Tuck, but was less willing to sit on the idea. He and Dabney both knew 
that the technology was approaching a point to make the concept viable, but would take some clever engineering to achieve. Bushnell's initial thought was to use a computer by Data General, a company founded by XDEC employees called the Nova, a mini computer which cost around 4,000 US dollars, but was more limited than most computers that ran Space War. Like Pitts and Tuck, he also recognized that the only way he could make this idea cost effective was if he was able to run multiple instances of Space War on that machine. A version of Space War already existed for the Nova, but neither Bushnell nor Dabney had much experience programming, so they enlisted help from Ampex co-worker Larry Bryan in the summer of 1970 and formed a partnership called Oh, whatever, it's some hippie name to do with the alignment of celestial bodies or something. However, the trio didn't last long. Brian quickly realized the infeasibility of time-sharing the Nova, leaving Bushnell and Dabney to continue the project while trying to find ways to minimize the computer's expense. Without an actual data general computer to work with, Bushnell had the idea of generating particular play elements through general circuitry and asked Dabney to help him create the technology to do this, divorced from a computer. This was only meant to be a supplement for controlling the mini-computer at first, but as they developed this hardware through January of 1971, Bushnell visited a computer center to test the timesharing solution he had developed for the Nova. He was told by the man at the center that his solution was not viable to run multiple versions of Space War. Once he realized this, coupled with having moved things like the score and the star field to a custom hardware solution, it became obvious that the computer was only holding them back. What they needed to do was to create specialized circuitry solely for running the game using transistor-to-transistor -transistor logic chips. Only then could they make the project feasible. With this new spirit in hand, Bushnell and Dabney would refine their simple display solution into an all-purpose hardware, which could run a game on a standard television set. They called their game Cosmic Combat, using parts borrowed from Ampex to construct an initial game prototype at Dabney's house in his daughter's bedroom. In the meantime, Nolan, cost proposition in hand, attempted to interest his bosses at Ampex to fund this coin-operated space war. He got nowhere with them, but happened to do a suggestion by his dentist regarding a nearby coin-operated company in Mountain View, California, called Nutting Associates, where fellow tenant Dave Ralston worked. Compared to the venerable Chicago-based amusement giants, this company was relatively new and small. Headed by Bill Nutting, they had created electromechanical quiz machines and penetrated new venues for coin-operated amusements, overcoming the stigma of those who continue to look at pinball as a poison pill. Stuck in a bit of a rut with his recent products, Nutting was enthused when Bushnell came in around early spring of 1971 with a potential new product, and hired him on as chief engineer to replace much of his recently departed staff. Bushnell arranged a deal to build his game as a contractor for Nutting Associates as part of a newly formed Syzygy company that Dabney and he had formalized, in order to maintain control of the technology behind it. Syzygy would license their technology to Nutting for a royalty fee. After completing the TTL circuitry work, Dabney would retain his job at Ampex, but help Bushnell on nights and weekends as they worked to turn the prototype into an actual representation of Space War. Or at least, as close as they could get to it. With no program to accompany the hardware, each of the game's features became difficult to implement. Everything had to be represented by pixelated dots, and aspects like the gravitational pole in the galaxy's center 
were abandoned. Getting the ship to rotate required designing four images of the vessel using neatly arranged diodes, then flipping the image along various axes to allow it to face in 16 different directions. Rather than facing off against other ships, the player shoots down UFOs within a time limit for score. The UFOs had their own AI, tracking what parts of the screen a player was likely to move to based on their current location, and firing missiles towards that area. Dabney also added sound effects, a first for fully integrated sound in a video game through some clever analog engineering. In many ways, it was Space War in inspiration only. With occasional help from people at Ampex, Bushnell managed to put together a hardware system with three circuit boards that could be sold to a cost of around 1,000 to 1,300 US dollars, which, while hardly a petty sum to the coin-op industry in 1971, was reasonable enough that Nutting Associates would give it the go-ahead. Bushnell was still looking for ways to make his version more viable, so Bill Pitts and Hugh Tuck were invited to come up and have a look at it. As technical people, they were impressed with the technology, but disappointed in how far the game had been taken from the original. Nolan, too, was disappointed that the duo had not devised a way to minimize the cost of a computer, despite both teams' best efforts. Whatever their desires or biases, the two would part ways and be sent on different paths with their coin-op versions of Space War. With their expensive monitor, computer, and target audience set, Pitts and Tuck would launch their game as Galaxy Game in Stanford's Tresidere Union in late November of 1971. The game was initially installed on the second floor in a music listening room before being moved to the first floor, where it started to gain incredible popularity. Due to space concerns, the PDP-1120 computer was placed in the attic and remotely hooked to the cabinet via a wire. Their version of Space War also differed from the original, but the freedom to play this game, not restricted by time-sharing hours, proved immensely popular with the Stanford students, and within a week, they had lines forming to play, prompting them to install a second monitor above the first purely for viewing the action. The two of them began work on a second machine, which incorporated two cabinets and a much more ergonomical blue fiberglass casing. Placed on location early to mid-1972 at a cost of 60,000 US dollars. Initially, the plan was to have four cabinets, but they didn't have space in the Tresidere Union to accommodate the units. They intended the second unit to be the start of their high-flung business plan to sell self-produced games to universities, but that proved impossible due to the expenses involved and expected returns. Still, that second version would remain installed at the coffee house for years to come, continuing to attract attention even as the coin-op world outside of the campus was evolving. Back at Nutting, Bushnell was eventually joined by Dabney as they readied the machine for test. Bushnell designed the cabinet, also fiberglass coincidentally, and Dabney would fashion up the controls, which included two main buttons and a swiveling joystick for turning the ship in space. They placed their unit at the Dutch Goose, a bar in Menlo Park, California, in the summer of 1971. As it would turn out, the bar was mainly visited by Stanford students who were familiar with Space War, so it did decently well. When they tested it at other, less trendy routes, it was discovered that the controls, along with the constant momentum of the ship, were rather complex for those who weren't computer-adept graduates. The issues came from the constant momentum of the ship, which could only be counteracted by spinning in the opposite direction to engage the thrusters. All this turning also proved that the original joystick was too fragile for arcade use. Buttons would have to do. The game, now called Computer Space, was showcased in Chicago at the Music Operators of America Expo in late October to mixed results. Several operators were afraid the television inside the game would be of such value that delinquents would steal it, 
and the rush to showcase the device meant that some of the engineering had not been totally finalized. They took no orders at the show, which could often be a death sentence for a new coin-op game. But Nunning Associates made the bold step of producing about 1,500 units for sale, which was quite a gamble given the company's size. Their sales force took the tactic of even offering the first few units free to some of their biggest distributors as soon as the machines rolled off the assembly line in late November of 1971. The units would be sold to operators for the cost of 1,850 US dollars, of which they sold somewhere between 1,300 and 1,500 units by the time all was said and done. It could be considered a minor success, with Nolan and Ted making out well for their work, but it did not stoke the fire like Bushnell had hoped, and proved to be much more tuned to the scientifically minded. That degree of complexity would become Bushnell's ultimate goal to surmount. How could he conquer such a hurdle without sacrificing the excitement? Anyways, the tale of the two space wars and their journey to pubs across California and eventually beyond the United States was one which needed to be done in order to solidify the idea of a gaming industry. This one commercial tract would be developed in its own direction, while other developments came to a head in parallel to Bushnell and Daphne's progress. It was all building to something big. Not necessarily things which had a big impact at the time of their release, but the important games which followed computer space would truly define the future of the medium. We're entering the stage of no return. All the pieces are in place. Video games are about to be defined.